or I go verse by verse, even to a fault, and that slide came up there, and I thought, that doesn't exactly fit what I want to say about Milo today, <laughs> but that's okay. And so this is the text that is next in our line, and so I want to turn our attention to what we recognize as a dead faith. I want to talk about an autopsy of a dead faith. Now, you know what an autopsy is. An autopsy is you go to the scene of a crime, and you, uh, a body is recovered, and part of forensics is you're trying to reconstruct what happened, what led to this tragic event. And an autopsy is especially concerned with looking at the subject of a murder or something like that and seeing what was the cause of this death. Now, the Bible tells us this, that earthly death is not true death, but we're told that there is a second death. Okay? And the Bible says that there's two types of faith. Did you know that? Did you know that there's two types of faith? There's faith that saves. Amen. And there is faith that does not save. James, in the book of James, he refers to one as living faith, and the other he calls dead faith. And it's possible to have a dead faith that disappoints, that deceives, and that destroys. And we all want to make sure that we have right, saving, living faith. Amen? But we also know it's possible to be deceived. So what I want to do is Jesus has given us in our text today, He has given us, if you will, a breakdown, an autopsy of dead faith. And by looking at it, we can discern what goes wrong. We can discern how to avoid being deceived. And to know that we are genuinely in the faith. So I want you to hear it with me, Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, if you've been with us for the past few weeks, you might remember a few weeks ago that we talked about the two roads, that there is a narrow road which leads to life. There is a broad road which leads to destruction. And from there, Jesus has been concerned with these two roads. Then he talks about two trees. It's another parable relating to those roads. He says there's an unhealthy tree which brings bad fruit. There's a healthy tree which brings forth good fruit. Again, we're seeing these two options. There's two roads. There's two trees. There's two fruits. There's two destinies. Then we transition. Now, you remember Jesus was talking about false prophets. He said those bad trees correspond to false prophets who deceive and a false message and the false believers who listen. Now we have the end of the story and we are before the judgment seat and we're looking at what happens at the end of that broad road. Now you might remember when I preached about the two roads. Now understand this. The narrow road is the road to salvation. We enter by Jesus. We proceed through sanctification. And the broad road, I think we can speak in broad terms and say that it is anyone who is not following Jesus, who has rejected Jesus, is on the broad road. But now in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking about something a little more narrow. Because as you go through, you'll find out that there's two kinds of believers. There are those who hear and do the words of Jesus, and there are those who hear and do not do. And so you'll notice that in the previous passage, you've got two kinds of trees. You've got false prophets. And the one produces bad fruit. Now here you've got people that get to the end of the broad road, but the people that we're talking about think that they should be saved. They think that they should be entering in. So what we're seeing here with these narrow road and broad road, in, in Jesus, the point he's making is not necessarily the general lostness of the world. He's saying people are going to hear my words. And based on what they do with my words, they're going to follow a path. They're going to make a decision one way or another. They're going to get on a path. And there are going to be people who hear truly and obey my words. And there are going to be people who hear and do not obey my words. And we're looking at the end of that broad road today. So I want to notice a few things about this passage. Number one, I want you to notice that the faith that saves produces true righteousness. 
The faith that saves produces true righteousness. Now we see here in this first verse, there is a negative, what we call a negative positive. A negative positive. So we, we would deny one thing and say something else. So I would say, this carpet is not blue. This carpet is some shade of red. Uh, I don't know. I know the seven primary colors. That's about all I know. <laughs> you might call it pink or red. Maybe it's mauve or maroon. But I would deny that it's blue, and I would say that it's a shade of red. Pretty obvious statement. It's a negative positive. Now notice Jesus makes a similar statement. He says, not everyone who says to me will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does. So he says, it's not the one who talks, it's the one who does. Do you see how that contrasts? It's not the saying one, it's the doing one. And I want you to notice something else about this passage. If you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must do the will of the Father who is in heaven. So the one who says will not enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. So notice these are very parallel statements. Now I want you to notice something. If we want to enter the kingdom of heaven, we need to do the will of the Father who's in heaven. So how are we going to know the will of the Father? Now, I want to say something very important here. There's a lot of discussion in recent days and a lot of discussion in our church culture about discerning the will of God. Every time I hear that phrase, I always cringe a little. I really do. Whenever I hear discerning the will of God, I always cringe a little. Sometimes I hear people say, well, here's how you can discern the voice of God. Let me tell you very briefly and very simply how you can discern the voice of God. It's that simple. God has spoken to us in these latter days by His Son. I often hear people that say, well, I'm trying to discern the will of God for my life. Well, how is your Bible reading? How, how is it? You might say, Pastor, I want to know the will of God for my life. That's easy. Scripture says the will of God is your sanctification. Plainly spoken. The will of God has more to do with what we plainly know than what we have to divine by sitting out on some mountaintop reading tea leaves. I've even known people, and I, I don't say this harshly, I don't say this in, in, in a judgmental way, I've known people that have actually rejected and lived in disobedience to some portion of Scripture and then said, I'm just trying to figure out what God wants me to do. It's never going to happen. Because you've, you've bypassed the narrow gate at that point. If you want to know the will of the Father who's in heaven, you must read His revealed will. How cruel would it be? How cruel would it be if God said, you must do my will, but He left us to go out somewhere and just concentrate and meditate and put things together and try to divine from inner impressions what His will is? How cruel would that be? But God has given us specifically, clearly, without any question, what His will is and what it consists of. You might say, well, I want to make sure I take the right job, be in the right place, marry the right person. If you obey the express commands of God in Scripture, you will wind up in the right job, in the right place, with the right person. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. You might say, Pastor, that's too simple. Have you tried it? You see, the will of God has not been tried and found impossible. It's not been tried because it is difficult. It is, goes against our flesh. We have found it unappealing, and we look for a substitute. Now, let me ask you a question. You, you know, when, when we're studying the Scripture, what, what's one phrase that I say is utterly important all of the time? I usually say it three times in a row. Somebody say it. It starts with a C. Context, context. Now, Jesus has just been talking for three chapters about how we are to live in the world. And then at the end of that, he says, you need to do the will of the Father. Where might be a good place to start to understand what the will of the Father is? These past three chapters of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus doesn't say, hey, here's a bunch of commands. Uh, make sure you're doing your righteousness in private uh, so you're not getting credit from men. Make sure that you're pure in heart. If there's sin in your life, cut it off. Cut your hand off if need be. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Go reconcile to your brother. Blessed are the peacemakers. Don't worry. Don't covet. Don't judge. And then Jesus says, but you know what? The will of the Father is something that you just can't discern. You've got to go out here and try and figure it out on your own. Well, that's absolutely absurd. Jesus says this, that I've told you what the Father expects, what He looks for, what He values, what He wants to see. And if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be characterized by what He has said. Jesus has said it plainly. He says here, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, do the will of the Father who's in heaven. 
What has he said previously? He said, well, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we're told that the spirit, poor in spirit enter the kingdom of heaven. He said, he said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Are we sensing a theme here? He said, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Perfect in that context does not mean sinless. It means being whole, sharing in the nature of the Father, having an inner righteousness that proceeds from Him. And then we're told to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things that we added to you. Jesus says to seek the kingdom of God, so you want to enter it, right? He says seek the kingdom of God and righteousness. Those two are married together. You can't seek to enter the kingdom of heaven if you're not seeking righteousness. We're told in Scripture that without holiness... No man will see the Lord. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. You might say, no, Pastor, I've been a Baptist all my life. You're challenging me. Well, let's get through the passage. The Lord knows those who are His. But we want to make sense of Scripture. We want to take Scripture on its own terms and its own merit. What Jesus has called us to in the Sermon on the Mount, He's called us to worship rightly. He's called us to relate to the things of the world in a way that denies self. He's called us to travel down a difficult road. He's called us to perhaps even be persecuted. He's called us to expect only our reward in heaven, not here. He's told us that judgment is rendered on the principles of righteousness. He's told us to consider the secret matters of the heart. Don't think that you're avoiding adultery if you're full of lust. And then he says, do the will of God. So, if this is challenging you, good. You might say, now, Pastor, I'm, I'm saved. I've believed on Jesus. I'm planning to go to heaven, but whew, this, is, this is a lot. This is, this, is, this is asking a lot from me. I want to point out something else really quick that I think is just has to be said. Many will say to me in that day, what? Lord, Lord. Did you know this is the first time in the New Testament that Jesus is ever called Lord? And he calls himself Lord. And, he, and the word there, Lord, Lord, is doubled. In the Old Testament, whenever the word Lord was doubled like that, it always referred to God Himself. Always referred to Yahweh. So what is Jesus doing when He applies the title Lord, Lord to Himself? Understand, Jesus says, many will say to me in that day. He's referencing the Old Testament reference to the day of the Lord, the coming day of God's judgment. Twist ending, guys. When you get to the day of judgment, the day of the Lord, who's going to be waiting there? Who's going to be doing the judging? Well, God will be, but Jesus is God. Jesus is the supreme judge. So, Lord, Lord. But what's amazing is that even these people who are turned away at the entrance to the kingdom of heaven are acknowledging Jesus' lordship, and it seems they're even acknowledging his divine nature and deity. Now that gets a little more disturbing for us. So, you might say, well, who's getting in? You might say, how can I know? How can we discern? Is it just a flip of the coin? Islam tells us this, that you can't know if you're going to heaven until you get there. Islam doesn't teach that Allah is, is gracious, personal, like a father. Allah is just, he's distant. And so you can observe the five pillars of Islam, die, and Allah could on a whim just say, no, it's not good enough, I just don't want to let you in. He's capricious. So Allah has the determination that even if you do His will, you can be turned away. Aren't we blessed to know, as Christians, that yes, God doesn't owe us salvation, but He has sent His Son to die for us. He has come near and He has become our Father, and He has told us, O oh man, what is good and what the will of the Lord is. And you can know from Scripture how things are going to go on the day of the Lord. Now, I hear a lot of times when I challenge people and we read the Scriptures, I hear people say, well, am I in? Am, am I one? And I, you know what? I'm going to say something that might be a little 
controversial. I think a little self-doubt is healthy every now and then. I think a little, because the Bible says to make our calling and election sure. The Bible says to consider ourselves whether we be in the faith. If you go through temporary times like, man, am I a Christian? And you go through the season of prayer and reading Scripture. I, honestly, I think those times are healthy. I think they're to be accept, uh, expected. Now, on the other side of that, you should come out with an assurance based on the Word of God <laughs> that you do belong to Him. But I think sometimes those ex periods of examination are healthy for us, lest we should be deceived. But we never want to doubt God's Word. We never want to doubt His promises. A lot of times when people are caught in some specific sin and they're in a time of sin in their life, they go through this question of doubting. And a lot of times our sanctification is directly related to our assurance. But I want you to notice this, that the faith that does not save, there is a faith that saves, and the faith that saves produces the righteousness of God. But I also want you to notice this, that the faith that does not save can be identified by its fruit. I want to make something clear. When I said that God's expecting obedience to His will, it is not as though that is a work that we must merit, that we must achieve salvation. One famous person said this, that the faith... We are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. James says faith without works is dead. We're not saved by our works, but we are saved to produce works. Works are not the means of our salvation, but they are the test of our salvation. They are the demonstration of our salvation. Works do not come before salvation. Works come after salvation. But nevertheless... Nevertheless, they must be present or salvation has not occurred. It's just that simple. So what does the faith that does not save look like? We want to autopsy this and we have the perfect opportunity in verse 22 and 23. Jesus plainly says, On that day, the day of the Lord, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. So they've got a good confession. Did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? So there's activity. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, if we examine this, we have the wonderful privilege of doing an autopsy, a faith going wrong, dead faith, and hopefully we can see what it takes to avoid that, what it takes to have true faith. So I want you to notice a few things. Number one, what's alarming is that many will say to me, just like many go down the broad road of destruction, the implication here is that this is, this is hard to hear but that many who hear the words of Jesus are going to twist it and get it wrong and not do His words. Our coming judgment is indicated by how we respond to Jesus' words now. And many are going to be disappointed. So let's look. I want you to notice one thing. Dead faith can acknowledge Jesus' lordship. Dead faith can acknowledge Jesus. You might say, now, Pastor, I think it's impossible to believe in Jesus and not be saved. Scripture tells us many will call me Lord. Many won't even just acknowledge me. They'll call me Lord. Jehovah's Witness have a Jesus, and they'll call him Lord. But he's the wrong Jesus. The Mormon church has a Jesus, and they'll call him Lord. But he's not the Jesus of the Bible, and it's not the plan of salvation of the Bible. Even Islam, I've already mentioned Islam. Did you know that they believe in Jesus? That might throw you for a loop. They absolutely do. Jesus is a prophet of Allah in Islam. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to see Jesus one day, and they're not going to be surprised. They're going, there's Jesus. There he is. But they're going to be surprised when he begins to open his mouth and declare to them who he is. There's going to be a lot of people who have lip service to Jesus, who Jesus is a token for them. I'm going to be very honest. There are going to be a lot of evangelical Christians for whom Jesus is a byword, for whom Jesus is a slogan, for whom Jesus is just an empty category of whatever we want Him to be. And they don't have the Jesus of the Bible. Without the Bible, you have no Jesus. It's just that simple. We're going to have a lot of people who, for them, Jesus is a crucifix around their neck, and that's all he is. We're going to have a lot of people for whom Jesus is merely a construct, merely an idol, 
merely a decoration they bring out at the end of year on December 25th and think about with very sentimental ideas. And that is a faith that will not save. Unless we have the Jesus who preaches the Sermon on the Mount. Unless we have the Jesus who cleanses the temple by turning over the tables. And unless we have the Jesus that sheds His blood on a cruel Roman cross for the atonement of sins, we don't have the right Jesus. James tells us in 2.19, you believe that God is one, you do well, that's great. But even the demons believe and they shudder. If I preach to you in such a way that I raise your knowledge level and that alone, then I have raised your faith to the level of demons. Congratulations. If you come to hear me preach so that you might learn knowledge and learn facts and learn Bible, then your faith has achieved the level of demons. They believe. They even looked at Jesus when Jesus would cast out demons, and they said, well, this is Jesus. It's the Holy One of God. They asked, did you come to torment us before the time when he went to cast demons out of legion? They confessed who he was. We see this. When there was a man possessed with demons that some men tried to cast demons out of in the book of Acts, and they said, we know Jesus, and we know Paul. We don't know you. When Paul and Silas preached in Philippi, there was a woman possessed with a demon who actually began to follow them and to verify and tell people that what they were preaching was correct. A demon. If all you have is head knowledge, and all you have is head knowledge about who Jesus is, and head knowledge about what the Bible says, you need to re-examine your faith. But... James says we must have a faith that leads to works. So, dead faith can acknowledge Jesus. What else can dead faith do? Dead faith can have an impressive ministry record. You might say, now hold on, Pastor. Now, Jesus said that you must do the will of the Father who's in heaven, but now you've got people standing before him who've been really busy. They've been casting out demons, they've been prophesying, they've been doing many mighty works. What more could you want? Pure in heart, poor in spirit, peacemaker, reconciler, sin killer, charitable, generous, prayerful, free from anxiety, doing unto others. You see, here is a dangerous, dangerous substitute. This doesn't say, the men that are standing before Jesus don't say, now Jesus, we pursued the spiritual disciplines. We prayed and we sought to eradicate sin from our lives. We followed holiness. Father, we would cut sin off when sin was present in us. It doesn't say, Jesus, we were humble and we lived a life of humility and we were generous and we sought to walk by the Spirit. It doesn't say that. It says things, we did religious activity. We preached, cast out demons. We did many miracles. When we substitute ministry busyness for personal righteousness, we set ourselves up for deception. If someone were to ask you, are you a Christian? You would respond, oh, of course I'm a Christian. I volunteer at the church. And I'm there every Sunday. I teach a Sunday school class. Man, I tithe right in front of everybody where they can see me. Oh, and I go knocking on doors trying to evangelize. Of course I'm a Christian. That's not going to cut it. Number one, you're not saved by works. But number two, the salvation that produces works, those are not the works that it is supposed to produce, first and foremost. Let me tell you, this is a danger for me as a pastor. Folks, let me tell you, I've been very busy in ministry for a very long time. Um, if I'm not working here at the church doing some sort of ministry, I'm writing papers for seminary and I'm doing deep, deep study of the Bible. And I'm going to tell you what the temptation is for me. The temptation is for me, well, of course I'm a Christian. I've read all the prominent theology books. Well, of course I'm a Christian. I can outline the Gospel of John from memory. Well, of course I'm a Christian. I can read the New Testament in Greek. Very few people can do that. Of course I'm a Christian. But let me tell you something. I'll go to hell with my Greek New Testament in hand. If the plain words of Scripture do not transform my life so that I am submitted to Jesus' Lordship. 
I will go to hell with my ordination certificate in my hand. If I prove to be a false teacher, as Jesus said, who is unhealthy and produces only bad fruit. Even if I might teach with the mouth the highest principles of righteousness, and I tell you, Briggs Road Baptist Church, you must be pure in heart, and you must cut off sin, and you must destroy lust in its nascent forms in your heart in order to please God. But I have lust, and I have envy, and I have those things in my heart. I might even be the means in the channel through which God saves you and myself go to hell. If my proof of my salvation is because I preached, I did miracles, man, I saw a lot of people delivered through my ministry, well, I'll be nothing more than like the preaching companion of Billy Graham many years ago, Charles Templeton, who preached alongside Billy Graham. People were saved through his ministry, but he eventually denied God, became an atheist, wrote a book. I think it was Farewell Letters to God or something like that. He's deceived. He's absolutely deceived. I'll be like so many disgraced, fallen, sinful leaders who, though they preached the principles of righteousness, did not attain them theirself. So an impressive ministry record. You can have that. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I don't have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So he's talking about the spiritual gift of speaking in tongues. Even if I have that. He says, if I have all prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, put it in today's terms, I go to seminary. Man, I read all sorts of theological journals and textbooks and historic theology. You know, I do that. I don't have faith. I don't have love. And he says, even if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. And if I give away all that I give, have, and I deliver even my body to be burned, but not have love, I gain nothing. Paul says, I could even be a martyr and do it for vain self-glory and be deceived. Goodness, Paul. And notice this, they didn't even do these things in their own name. They did them in the name of Jesus. We did these things in your name. Your gifting as a Christian is not a, a proof of your salvation. Your activity as a Christian is not a proof of your salvation. Even your experiences. Man, these people had experiences. What better experience would you want to be able to cast out a demon? I mean, you would think if you can cast out a demon, surely you're a Christian. Surely you, you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. I mean, it's not what Jesus says. You might say, no, Pastor... I'm, I, I, I remember having an experience. Oh, goodness, what an experience I had. Oh, I cried. I wept tears when I got saved. The Bible says that Esau wept bitterly and didn't repent. The Bible says the rich young ruler was sorrowful, and he walked away with his possessions. You might say, now, Pastor, when I got saved, I saw a vision. Mm -mm, no, no. Paul said it's possible for an angel, of, uh, an angel of deception to appear to you. One of the Mormon boys came to my house not long ago. And they said, if you will read the Book of Mormon, you will feel a warming of your heart. And if you ever talk to the Mormons, that's a phrase they use. It's one of their trade phrases. The warming of the heart. And they say, we know it's real because of what we feel. If your faith is based in feeling, based in experience, you have no faith. If you don't have a faith that can stand objective scrutiny, and if you don't have a faith that is based in reality, and if you don't have a faith that's based in the historical occurrences of God in the history of the world, and you don't have a faith that is based in the clear revealed words of Scripture where God has plainly spoken, given you the terms and conditions, you have no faith. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Now hear these sobering words of Paul. He says, I discipline my body and I keep it under control lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. Paul says, it is very possible 
that I, after preaching to others, could go into destructive sin and be disqualified. There's a lot of debate as to what disqualified means, but the word that's used there, the Greek word, it's always used in Scripture of the context in which someone is utterly, completely, and eternally lost. I think Paul in humility is holding out the possibility that he himself could be deceived and the marker and the test and the metrics by which he has assurance is his perseverance as a Christian. That is his assurance. Jesus told the disciples one time they came back, they were so happy that they could cast out demons. Jesus, we get to do what you do. And Jesus said, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You might say, man, if you can believe in Jesus and have ministry activity and still not make it in, what, what's going wrong? Well, we find out the missing element. We've already told the missing element in verse 21. The one who does the will of the Father. We're reminded of it in verse 23. You workers of lawlessness. What these disciples were missing. What these false disciples, false teachers were missing. Was the righteousness which God requires. We talked about a parable in Sunday school today. About a wedding feast. And the king gave a wedding feast for his son who was to be married. And he invited all these people. None of them showed up. So he invited more people, and they all came. So he made one call, which was rejected, and he made a, another call, which had an effect. A powerful call. And they all came. And we find out, though, we had one extra. A man came in, and he didn't have on the proper attire for the occasion. And he was kicked out. And we're told that that's a metaphor for being cast into hell. Because he didn't come in the right way. That's what we're dealing with in this text. They're cast out. They don't have on a wedding garment. They're not accepted at the feast. Why? Because the king demanded that if you're going to come to his son's wedding, you had better dress for the occasion. And God has demanded of us righteousness. You must say, now, Pastor, you've always gone into work salvation. No, I've not. Because, listen to this church, what God requires, God provides. You and I couldn't keep the law, so he sent Jesus to keep it in our stead and to die in our place. It is true at the same time that those who disobey the Lord live a life of unrepentance, disobeying and snobbing the commands of the Lord no matter what they profess with their mouth, will be turned away. But it's also true that every scrap and every sliver of your obedience and your sanctification and your growth as a Christian does not come from your human efforts, but it is a gift from the Lord. If you will be saved, you must have the righteousness that God demands and that God gives. And I want you to notice this. Now, James said that. He said, what good is it, my brothers, if he says he has faith, but he doesn't have works? He says faith by itself is dead without works. Now, I want to notice the final thing. There's a twist ending in this story. He says, well, you've got to have, do the will of the Father to get in. He says, there's going to be people. They're going to, they're going to know who I am. They're going to do a lot of things but I'm not going to know who they are. I want you to notice this. These false disciples knew who Jesus was, but Jesus didn't know who they were. Now, hold on a minute. God is all-knowing. Jesus knows all things. We understand that. But nevertheless, he says, I never knew you. And this doesn't mean general knowledge. God knows all things. This is talking about something else besides just general knowledge of the facts. God is not ignorant. There's nothing hidden from his sight. One pastor said this, a faith that falters before the finish was faulty from the first. So Jesus says, I never knew you. What does it mean when Jesus says, I never knew you? If you go back into the Old Testament, you read that the word know is used in a euphemistic way. Adam knew his wife and she bore children. You may remember that one. 
That's not talking about he knew who she was. It's talking about an intimacy that was exchanged between the two. God told Israel that you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Well, God knows everything. He knows everybody. What does it mean that he only knew Israel? We're told that God knowing his people is an intimate relationship. We're not talking about general knowledge here. We're talking about an intimate relationship which God has with his people. Galatians 4, Paul talks about it in verse 8 and 9. Now hear what's being said. Paul says to the Galatians, formerly when you did not know God. Now notice this, they did not know God. You were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. Verse 9, but now that you have come to know God. So he said previously you didn't know God, but now you've come to know him. But Paul says, oh, wait a minute. Let me clarify something. Now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God. Now, wait a minute. You've come to know God, but really what's happening here is you've come to be known by God. That's a totally different saying. How can you then turn back to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? 1 Corinthians 8.3 says that if anyone loves God, he is known by God by God now does God save us because we love him no no we love him because he first loved us that does not mean that God loved us and we thought oh how sweet of God to love me I think I'll just love him right back what that means is that the love of God actually produces in us the love for him God gives us what he requires now, if you read this from a human point of view, well, if anyone loves God, God will know him. God will look down and say, oh, I see, Brother Ray, he, know, he loves me. Well, you know what, I think I'm just going to get to know him. No, 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 no. If anyone loves God, it is because he has been known by God. So you understand that God knows his people in a special way that's not spoken of. We have to be able to take all of Scripture... At the same time, the Bible tells us that those who come to Jesus, he will never cast out. He holds them in his hand. No man is able to pluck him out. Paul tells us that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. I think that even means the indwelling sin that dwells in us. We are told that we are sealed until the day of redemption. We are kept through the power of God. But we're also told to take heed, lest thinking we stand, we fall. We're also told to make our calling and election sure. We're also told this, to not cast away our confidence, which has great reward. We're also told that he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And we're also told that we must do the will of the Father who is in heaven. You can't pick and choose. What's fascinating is that from a human perspective, these people had refused to repent. They had refused to conform their life to the will of God which means they never truly submitted themselves to Jesus' lordship. If you confess Jesus as Lord, then what comes from that is you live as though you are his servant. If you confess Jesus as Lord and you don't live as though you're his servant, then you've not really confessed him as Lord, have you? So what we see in this story is that these people are coming before the Lord and they're found wanting because they've not done certain things. And if we just stop right there, we think, well, salvation is dependent on man. But then we learn that there's a root issue that even underlies that. And that root issue is this, that they were never known by Jesus. Twist ending. So we see, we see it working out from man's perspective and then something is revealed to us. Let me give you a passage that tells us about God's knowledge of his people, particularly Romans 8, 29 and 30. For those whom he foreknew. He predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, wait a minute. The problem with these people standing before Jesus is that they had not been conformed to the righteous standard revealed by God. But we are told in Scripture that God has foreknown certain people. And he has so ordained that they 
will be. He has ensured that it must come to pass that they will be made like Jesus. Your salvation does not depend on your performance. The works that God demands of you does not depend on your righteousness. But God has so ordained that He will create them in you. And if you find them lacking in you, the answer is not try harder. The answer is to get on your knees before a holy God and beg Him to give you that which you lack and cannot produce. Because those He foreknew, He ensured, He locked it in, He made it certain, and He predestined that they be conformed to the image of Christ. You might say, I don't like that word, it's in Scripture, take it up with God. So those who He foreknew, He knew them. He predestined them. And then, verse 30, who He predestined, He also called. Jesus will not call you to Himself and then turn you away. There was a man who came to the feast and he didn't have on a wedding garment. They're turned away. They hadn't been called. Those he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. What we are told here is that those that Jesus knows, he completes it. You're left with two options from this text. You either believe that salvation is dependent on what you do, or you believe that salvation is dependent on what God does in you and for you. There's no middle way. There's no middle way. And I love this. I'm going to close with this verse. 2 Timothy 2.19. This is the word of the Lord. Paul is telling Timothy about people who have fallen away from the faith. He has said that there have even been people who've been led astray and their faith has been shaken. Kind of giving the impression that people can lose their faith and fall away. But Paul says to Timothy, But God's firm foundation stands. Bearing this seal, the Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. There's a foundation of faith. In the previous verse, Paul says it's been shaken for some people. Some people are falling off of the foundation. They're falling off of their confession. They're going back to the world. And Paul says, if you're going to believe in Jesus, you've got to depart from iniquity. Kind of gives you this impression that we're just being shaken up and you just got to hang on the best you can. But Paul says, in the midst of that, God knows who are His. He knows them. And they're His. As you look around, believer, and you see people falling away from Christ, you see people departing from the faith, you see people who once professed and now they've gone astray, you see people who now live an opposite life to what they've once confessed, you see people and you think, I don't know that they ever truly knew the Lord Know this, that the Lord knows them who are His. And the work that He has begun in them, He will complete it. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. And if He is not the author, He won't be the finisher. And if He is not the author and the finisher, we're going to wind up like these people. You might say, Pastor, how do I know? You don't know just by a lip confession to Jesus. You don't know because you've been busy. You don't know because you had an experience. You know if the Holy Spirit is in you and daily conforming you and convicting you and making you like Jesus. He calls us and He justifies us and one day He'll glorify us in heaven. But you don't get from point A to point C without point B and that is being conformed to the image of His Son. Do you want to stand before God one day? And here, well done, good and faithful servant. You can know that. It is not up in the air. But you should examine yourself. Am I in the faith? Do I bear the marks of someone whom God has called and is conforming? If I do not, I need something which I am desperately lacking, which only God can give. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord of heaven and earth, that you know those who are yours. You know me. And God, I know that I'll never be turned away by the Lord who calls me. 
Father, may we persevere. And God, if there's anyone today who has any doubt as to where they stand with you, may they make it sure. For it can be sure. And we can know. And Father, you won't turn anyone away who comes to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.